Welcome to Game Point, a whole new ball game. I'm your host, Sam Jones, and I'll be joined today by SUTV sports reporters Colton Poole, Ali Thorson, Mitch Johnson, and KNDS radio personality Taylor Kerr. On today's lineup, we'll recap the San Diego State-NDSU game and recap the last couple of months for NDSU athletics. We'll also look at our Final Four predictions and preview the Sweet 16 game tonight. And finally, we will talk about MLB. But first up, the recap of the San Diego State game. I'm joined here by Colton and Ali. Uh, guys, what's your uh, quick takeaways from that game? Well, obviously that game was very, very physical, and, and everyone knew that was going to happen coming into the game. I mean, obviously you've got guys like Marshall Bjorklund who, against uh, Oklahoma, you know, got, got that bruise under his eye or cut under yeah. his eye, whatever it was, uh, and just they, they looked like they were in a bar fight after that Oklahoma <laughs> game. And I mean, and then again, against San Diego State, one of the best uh, defenses in the country, you knew that that game was going to be physical. And I mean, obviously it was, but NDSU couldn't keep up. And it, it, was, it was kind of disappointing to see how NDSU's leading field goal percentage efficiency team, I mean, they, they struggled from the field. They struggled in every aspect. And uh, Corey Brown, you know, what a game for him. Uh, game high or career high 13 points, but uh, you know when your physical defender is your is your offensive leader as well. I mean, uh, that, that 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 doesn't bode well for for NDSU and yeah. Like, and the, I mean, the scouting report was you know leave him open because he doesn't shoot a lot, which he mm -hmm. doesn't. But they left him open, he started scoring. But unfortunately, he was it, the only one that really got something going. That whole team, that whole time, uh, SDSU's defense was just saying, you know, Corey Brown, go ahead and try to beat us, because they shut down Taylor Braun, they shut down Marshall Bjorklund, uh, and L.A. didn't have the game that he had against Oklahoma. They even tried getting Carlin Dupree in there, yeah. didn't really get much going. Mike Felt couldn't get him going from three-point range. Uh, I just just a struggle offensively for NDSU. Defense wasn't the problem for them, that's for sure. Yeah, Allie, what did you see? I think that was, like you said, one of the most physical games we had seen, and for Corey Brown to come up and shine like that, it was great. But when you see a game like that where Corey Brown is your leading scorer, where he hasn't been all season, you know something's just not quite right with the offense. And I think what we can take away from that game is, yes, San Diego State was remarkable, but I think the major story of that game was how NDSU's offense was just completely struggling throughout the entire game. Yeah, I thought they were getting good looks for the most part. They just couldn't get them to go down. Those are shots they uh, normally make. They just having a hard time making them. And NDSU, they fought back and forth in that first half, but they started to pull away later in the first half and definitely pulled away in, in the second half because of two words, Xavier Thames. Scores 30 points, game high, uh, or team high, five assists, scores 16 points in the first half, but didn't make a single two-pointer. He made four free throws and four three-pointers to get that 16 points. And I mean, when he's lighting it up from three-point range, and then he ends up the, with the night with 30 points to carry that team. I mean, looking at the rest of that uh, that scoring column for SDSU, they had one other double-digit score, but everyone else was around five, six points. Two. Yeah, th 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 they didn't really have any other contributors. Xavier Thames is what truly trumped NDSU in that one. And he was four for nine on the three points, but. I think we can all say as we were watching that game, it seemed like a lot more than four three-pointers were coming from Xavier Thames. Yeah, and then uh, that guy uh, got other, uh, also got in double figures. He had 15, but I believe they were just about all three-pointers. Uh, I Just them two alone basically beat the team if you don't count everyone else. But, you know, they, they put forth their best effort. Uh, it, was, it was still a good game, though. And, and Taylor Braun, I mean, well, what a, what a, a journey for him going 30 over plus 30 points in the Denver game in the Summit League and then struggling a little bit in the IPFW game until the very end where he scores 10 out of the 11 uh, teams points and gets them to a Summit League title uh, championship and but then in the NCAA tournament it was just kind of it seemed it, like Taylor Braun kind of disappeared throughout the tournament. And he, he admitted, unfortunately, and he admitted that himself, and it it was it was so disappointing to see him struggle like he did. But he, there was aggression was definitely not not yeah, the that wasn't weak the problem. point. He, no. he kept attacking. He kept trying as hard as he could. And for him and all of NDSU during the SDSU game, at Braun during the NCAA tournament as a whole, they were getting good shots. It, it, just, it was just 
they just didn't go. I, I think he, they got the jump the jump shots that they wanted. The, he got the driving shots that he wanted. But Taylor Taylor Braun and NDSU and the uh, NDSU's offense in the SKSU game just didn't click. And you were right to say this game was completely physical, and we could see that from Taylor Braun with the huge knob on his head and the gash in his back. This team was putting forth all their effort. Unfortunately, the shots just didn't go in. Yeah, but I guess one thing to really take away from the season is they won their first ever tournament game as a school. And that's also part of a list of accomplishments that we've had throughout the season just as a, a program it, it itself. Uh, it's just mm -hmm. been a really great year these last, what, 200 days, 300 days, just, just in general, just for all the athletic uh, teams. I mean, so, some, somewhere Gene Taylor is, has, has a smile <laughs> on his face. Yeah. Uh, because what a year it's been for him and for all of NDSU athletics to win a third straight FCS national championship, to have that upset win over uh, Kansas State, your big returning Big 12 champions, and they even appeared in a bowl game, and to have that upset win over Oklahoma and grab all of the national attention that they did. And then not only that, but all the other different sports. Stephen Monk gets third place in uh, in wrestling for them, uh, and all the other sports as well. Yeah, our wrestling program has made such huge strides this year, getting into the top 20 in the USA Today poll and the 21st in the Intermat poll. This, I mean, we've had several wrestlers within the top 20 in the matter Intermat poll as well. It really has been just an outstanding season for NDSU athletics so far, and we're not even done. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we sent about four other or three other wrestlers, excuse me, uh, to nationals as well. I mean, they didn't fare as well as Monk did, but you know, Monk kind of helped put us on the map. That was the best uh, anyone's ever done NDSU for uh, as a Division One athlete for wrestling. And what a success story for that guy! I mean, his sophomore year get, is one win away from All American. Junior year one win away from All-American. And then his senior year, he finally breaks, breaks that barrier and gets third place. And it was, it was a success story for, for him and for all of NDSU wrestling, like you said, Allie, uh, being able to get that high ranking and put NDSU wrestling on the map. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's also great for uh, Robert, or, uh, Roger Kish, excuse me, yeah. Robert Kish, or Roger Kish, the uh, coach. Uh, that's gonna really help with recruiting. Uh, just how he got those guys to where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a great wrestling career as well. Uh, and then we got the women's uh, track and field. They won their seventh straight a summer league title this year, indoor track and field. And the women's cross country also won uh, their third title as well. Mm -hmm. So I mean, just a lot of winning going on around here. Mm -hmm. uh, and just overall, just great performances by, I mean, all the athletic teams, I mean, Looking at NDSU golf, NDSU, uh, you know, football, wrestling, basketball, obviously. Softball, um, baseball. Softball and baseball, definitely. They, baseball, I think they've uh, definitely got a, sh a shot anyway at a at a Summit League title. And, and I mean, how how many conference titles can you collect in a year? And, and it, it's and definitely considering the fact that about a decade ago, NDSU it was just coming off a Division One. Uh, division two to div two division one transfer. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> amazing to see where we've gone in just these short ten years from division two to division one and all the success that we've had. And I think it's great how for each sport we can pinpoint at least one person or coach that really has stood out. I mean, not, well, as we were talking about basketball, not just Taylor Brown, but look at Coach Phillips. Not only has he been a finalist for the mid-major coach of the year, he's also the 2014 Barefoot Coach of the Year from Samaritan's Feet, and that is a huge honor. And we go to, as we said, women's track and field. We have Maddie McClellan, who is the Summit League Indoor Track Athlete of the Year. We also have one for the men's. I mean, every single sport so far this year, we can pinpoint at least a few people that have you know, made it and gotten some very good recognition. Yeah, and there's also been a lot of school records just broken in men and women's track, so I mean, that's also amazing as well. And then also, back to uh, Coach Phillips, second uh, Summer League Coach of the Year honors, uh, second time getting a team to the NCAA tournament in just six seasons. So that's, that's also amazing. Some teams take longer years just to even get to the tournament. There's teams out there that haven't made it. And, uh, I mean, Looking at you know Coach Phillips obviously, but 
It's, it's awesome to see these awesome personalities of NDSU getting success. I mean, just looking at Coach Phillips, I mean, that guy said during the, per, during the NCAA tournament press conference that he never doesn't have a smile on his face. And th that, I mean, shines through for all NDSU athletics, uh, the personalities all the way through. And that, and you know, that North Dakota, Minnesota, uh, nice. work, yeah, nice and, you know, work ethic. Yeah, work I ethic. Love, I love to see just an old school athlete succeeding. And that's great to see. I think we're not short of that. From Phillips all the way to our former coach, Bowl. I mean, work ethic is something that is put into all of these athletes strongly. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's something that we'll continue to keep doing uh, throughout the rest of our sports and hopefully in the future. Well, uh, coming up after the break, KNDS radio personality Taylor Kurth will be joining me, and we'll be talking about our Final Four predictions and a preview tonight's Sweet 16 game. Stick with us. The NDSU Bookstore, where every true fan and alum goes to get their pride on. Gear up with a variety of high-quality t-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, and more. Made by top-of-the-line brands like Under Armour, Nike, and CI Sport to help you show off your prize and pride. The NDSU Bookstore has everything you need in your two favorite colors, green and gold. The future is constantly unfolding. No one knows better than those preparing for it. Every week, NDSU's student-run television organization, the Bison Information Network, brings you SUTV News with news about NDSU, the campus community, and current events affecting you. Watch SUTV News on Cable One, Channel 14, Friday and Saturday at 9 p.m. and Saturday and Sunday at 9 a.m. Deke's Pizza, prices with the student in mind. Fast delivery and conveniently open until 3 a.m. Order by phone at 701-235-0708. Order online at deekspizza.com or order with Deke's easy to use mobile app. NDSU, make Deke's your choice for pizza this semester. That's Deke's, great pizza that won't empty your pockets. I'm at bus because not only does it save me money, but with 20 different routes, it makes getting around Fargo much more convenient. I'm at bus. Do you? Welcome back to Game Point, a whole new ball game. I'm now joined by KNDS radio personality Taylor Kerr. <coughs> And we'll be talking about our Final Four predictions and preview tonight's Sweet 16 games. So, Taylor, before this uh, tournament started, who was in your Final Four? In my Final Four, I had Wisconsin, I had Louisville, Michigan State, and Florida. Me, I had Duke, Kansas, Creighton, and Michigan State. Now, uh, we take a look at our graphic here. Only team that's left in mine is Michigan State. Everyone else lost. Uh, which, one, which one of them did you have winning at all? Kansas. Okay. I had Kansas winning it gotcha. all. Gotcha. Who'd you have winning it all? I had Florida winning it all. Florida. Yeah, I thought that you know Kansas was gonna be able to hold it down mm -hmm. until Embiid came back mm -hmm. and they go out and lose. Yeah. And Duke losing in the first round just really shocked me. I thought Parker. Ch I thought Parker was gonna come yeah. with it. Four for fourteen. Yeah, that was. Oof. That that hurt. Yeah, I mean, that that's the thing about college basketball though. It's like if you replay this tournament ten times over again, you're never gonna have the same outcome. There's gonna be a new champion each different time. Yeah. Because that that's I think that's the greatest thing that college basketball has over NBA is that there's such parity in college basketball that on any given night any team can really go out and compete with any other team. Yeah, unless you get those years like uh, Kentucky a few years ago yeah. and uh, North Carolina where they just breezed through the tournament and mm. killed everyone. Yeah. But those don't happen too often. No, not at all. For the most part, every team is more or less on the same playing field and any any one guy can get hot. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I thought uh, Doug McDermott was going to stay hot mm. and 
it's not like he didn't show up. Yeah. He showed up, but he only had 15 points, and yeah. the rest of his team just completely didn't show up. And, and, yeah, and that's what happens for a three-point shooting team. If they have a down night, then so long, see you later. True, but I just didn't see them losing by 30. Yeah. <laughs> that, I was shocked. My right. mouth dropped when I saw that. I was scr- left scratching my head. For sure, for sure. Uh, what do you see for tonight's games? Well, tonight, you know, they got the four games. They got Kentucky and Louisville, Michigan, Tennessee, <laughs> Iowa State, UConn, and MSU versus Virginia. Uh, Kentucky and Louisville, I think that's going to be the best game out of the four of them. Just from the standpoint that, you know, they're both right in Kentucky. You know, this is one of the biggest rivalries in college basketball. And it's going to be a big game. Louisville's only lost once since February. You know, and Kentucky needed a career game from all their players from all their players and they played their best game all year and they barely beat the Shockers. And that was their best game that they played all year. You know, the Harrison Twins had 39 combined points and they only beat them by two. So, you know, I'm, I'm picking Louisville on that on, in that game, but it can go either well, way. That could have been their best game or you could say their best game could have been in a loss and, you know, you can take a lot away from us. When they lost to Florida in the SEC championship okay. game, mm-hmm. they only lost by one point. Right. And they're the number one overall seed, mm-hmm. one of the prohibited favorites to win the tournament. Yeah. So that, that gives you some momentum because they had just lost to them in double figures, what, like a week before. Yeah. And they turn around and only lose by a point. So that's building momentum. Right. I guess the, maybe they're sharing the ball more and getting more people involved. It's not just, you know, mm-hmm. I want to get my stats. Right. And looking at it the next couple, they're, they're really trying to win. So I think they'll get up for this game mm-hmm. because I feel like the bigger the competition, the more focused they're going to be. Right. But they also have the habit of playing down to their competition as well. That's true. But, uh, I'm looking on the Louisville side. I'm looking for Russ Smith. Yep. Where is Russ Smith? Yep. He, he really hasn't been there the last couple right. of games. He's been really off. And then he was missed a whole bunch of threes when they played in Kentucky last time. Mm. So I'm looking for him to have a big game and step up like stars do. And if he doesn't, Louisville might be in trouble. Oh, yeah. So who do you have? Who I have for tonight? Yeah, for Louisville, Kentucky. I'm going with Kentucky. Uh-huh. I actually had Kentucky, Louisville in this game, and I had Kentucky winning. Okay. But then I had Kentucky obviously losing to Duke. Right, right. But, yeah, <laughs> I have Kentucky for this game. Gotcha. Then, you know, Michigan, Tennessee, that's going to be a big game. It's not, it, you know, you look at the seeds and you see 2-11, and 11, and you're like, oh, Michigan, that's Michigan, you know, to yeah. win. But the thing is, Tennessee is no slouch. Tennessee is a very good team, and I honestly think Tennessee is going to win this game. And it's not your, like I said, it's not your typical two eleven seed because Tennessee was rated very low. They really they, were. They should have been a five or a six. And you know they got two big guys down low, Jarnell Stokes and Joe Maimon. And Michigan hit fourteen threes, to, and that's what you know that's that's been their mo really all year since they lost Mitch McGarry shooting the three. Yeah. And they shot four, and they made 14 against Texas, and that was a big reason why they beat Texas. If they don't make their threes tonight against Tennessee, Tennessee's going to have them down low. Yeah, because if you look at it, you live by the three or you die by the three. Yep. And that, I feel like, is also what happened when Oklahoma played NDSU. Because mm-hmm. when I'm watching that game, all Oklahoma is doing is hitting threes, but they really weren't driving to the basket yep. or anything. So if Michigan can't drive to the basket, they're going to be in trouble. I do like Nick Stauskas, though. He's been balling this year. Uh, stepping up in the place of uh, Trey Burke, who left for the NBA. Mm-hmm. So I want to see if he can step up and be a star and uh, do his thing and lead Michigan in this game. Um, this one, I'm just going to say you can flip a coin. Right. And whoever's going to win this one. I don't really have a definite pick for this one. Right. Then we got Iowa State and UConn. Melvin Ejum and DeAndre Kane. I don't know. Those are two very good guys. They lost Gorgeous Nang with the broken foot and, you know, going against Nabir Sh- or Shabazz Napier. We, I, I like Iowa State. I think Ejim and Kane can trade buckets with Napier because, I mean, they're kind of a one-man show at this point. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that one. I'm going with uh, Iowa State. Uh, I do like Shabazz Napier, but that's the only guy I can really think of on their team. Yeah. Uh, especially when they were down by 15 in the first round. And, I mean, they came back and won. Right. But they should have never been down by 15. Yeah. And if they get down by double figures Iowa State, they're not winning this game. No. They're going to lose DeAndre Kane. Is uh, been has been a real nice uh, bright point for them. Yeah. Uh, I am going with Iowa State to win this game here, and I mean UConn can. I mean yeah, for they sure. can, but I think Iowa State. And, and then we got MSU and Virginia. I got MSU. They just been playing fantastic ball right now. Yeah, they got healthy. They've been they've been playing right. I mean Virginia. It's not going to be a walk in the park. Yeah. 
Virginia won the ACC regular season and tournament title. They dominated the ACC this year. It's not going to be an easy out for Michigan State. This is right. going to be one of those games that comes down to the wire. Mm -hmm. It's probably whoever has the ball last. Probably. Uh, Adrian Payne might do his thing tonight. Yeah, uh, 41 points against 41 Delaware. Points. Yeah. But in the end, Michigan State. Yeah. All right, well, coming up next, Mix Johnson will be joining me, and we will be previewing the upcoming MLB season that starts next week. Jitters is the NDSU Campus Community's Coffee Hub. Conveniently located right next to campus, Jitters Coffee has a wide range of amenities, including comfortable seating, Wi-Fi, and an assortment of beverages. Jitters is here to meet your needs, whether you're looking to relax and socialize or study in a rich, active environment. Be sure to make your way over for your morning brew, a bite at lunch, or for a break between classes. Get your fix only at Jitters. The NDSU Bookstore, where every true fan and alum goes to get their pride on. Gear up with a variety of high quality t-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, and more. Made by top of the line brands like Under Armour, Nike, and CI Sport to help you show off your prize and pride. The NDSU Bookstore has everything you need in your two favorite colors, green and gold. The future is constantly unfolding. No one knows better than those preparing for it. Every week, NDSU's student-run television organization, the Bison Information Network, brings you SUTV News with news about NDSU, the campus community, and current events affecting you. Watch SUTV News on Cable One, Channel 14, Friday and Saturday at 9 p.m. and Saturday and Sunday at 9 a.m. Welcome back to Game Point, a whole new ball game. I'm now joined here by Mitch Johnson, and we're going to be uh, talking about this MLB season that's getting ready to start up here. Uh, Mitch, uh, what's your thoughts on this opening season? So it's far? it's coming up fast. My favorite time of year is baseball season. It's coming up really fast. Um, they actually had technically, if you want to get technical, the season did start um, last week. They played two games in Australia, and the reason for that, they just it's kind of like you know when the NFL goes to London, they want to expand, they want to expand the NFL. They're trying to expand the MLB. Um, by going to different countries and stuff. So they played in Australia. Uh, first two games, um, Dodgers and Diamondbacks actually played, and the first two games the uh, Dodgers took. So um, good games to watch, and it was, it was just it was kind of fun to watch. So Yeah, so uh, did you happen to catch any of those games? What did you pick up from those games? Um, I, didn't, I didn't get a chance to pick up from them, but um, just, j it was just a good way to start. Um, Van Slyke from the Dodgers hit his first home run of the season in the first game, and Trumbo, Mark Trumbo, Used to be with Los Angeles Angels. He's now with Arizona. He had his first home run in the second game as well. So um, it's just kind of fun to watch in a different different country. So, so do you think that that game is going to do a lot for baseball? Kind of like you know for the NFL in London. Do you think it's going to do a lot? I mean, you know, I know the NBA has preseason games in Europe. Do you see this having the same effect for MLB? Um, I think so. I mean, I think they will continue it as you know because I feel like the NFL has you know they go to London every year you know at least once or twice a year. I think they wanted MLB wanted to try this out and see how it went. And Commissioner Bugs Healy said it went really well this season. So um, I think they're going to keep doing this um, every season. And maybe they'll play more than just you know a couple games. So, OK, so for the opening day here in the US, what are some key things? What, what are you looking at here? Um, opening day starts Sunday, technically. Um, again, Dodgers play at San Diego for the opening day. Um, you have Ryu against Kashner as a starting probable pitchers. Um, it's it'll be it's just gonna be fun, um, and then you have the rest of the opening day games are gonna play on Monday, um, like the Twins they'll play at Chicago White Sox, so um, it'll be it'll be good. Okay, so taking a look at this graphic here, uh, you got Cano signing in a new place, Cabrera in a new place. What are they gonna do for their teams? Um, I think the big the signing yesterday with Cabrera to Detroit, he signed a 
$300 million deal over 10 years. Um, that's going to be huge. He pretty much said he'll stay in, with Detroit for the rest of his career. Um, he is an, he's an elite player. I mean, I'm, I say future Hall of Famer with him, and he's going to be good. So, Let's get back to that real quick. You said 10 years, $300 million? Yes, correct. Yep. So $30 million 30, each, each thir of the next 10 years. Yeah, $30 million per year. So that's it's, crazy. Yeah, it's, that is ridiculous. When you have, when you have a um, triple crown winner, and then he was pretty close to getting triple crown last year as well, I mean, a player like that deserves money like that. I mean, it's just, I, I saw what he you know, got in the next 10 years, and I was just shocked. I, I cannot believe it. I, I'm shocked, too, because you got uh, Pujols, who had, what, was a $250 million contract? Yep, yep. Pujols, he got that, Cano got his big contract, but $300 million, that's kind of, would you say that would be like a record deal? That's, it? it's, it's pretty close to record deal. Pretty close to yeah. record deal. Yeah. Yeah. So. And my whole thing is, guys sign these type of contract, but it doesn't seem like they're, like, they start off good, but then it's like, towards the end, it's like, why are we paying them this much yeah. money? Like, I don't understand why they give these guys 10 years on contract. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to see, like, I mean, Josh Hamilton, he signed a big contract with the Angels, and now he hasn't been doing too well. But I think with um, Cabrera really proved himself in Detroit. I mean, he really showed that he is an elite player. He's good. He's going to be good for another couple of years. I mean, he's still a young guy, so he's, he's going to be a good player for the next couple of years. So. All right, do you see that signing – getting Detroit to where they need to be or um yeah they made they made some big offseason moves too this year they traded the biggest trade I think for Detroit biggest one of the biggest moves was when they traded away Prince Fielder who they just got two years ago they traded him to Texas for Ian Kingsler and I think that was that was a smart play I mean uh, Detroit needed a second baseman and it'll be I'm predicting uh, Dodgers and Detroit in the World Series so all right so staying in the Midwest let's talk some twins some local yep. sports here what do you see for the twins Twins, I think they're gonna play 500 baseball this season, or maybe just under 500. Um, they got some good new pitchers, Ricky Lasco, and they re-signed Mel Mike Pelfrey, and they got Phil Hughes from the Yankees. Um, they're still, I mean, they're not gonna be in contention winning the Central, but I mean, they're gonna get better than last season. So, um, like I said, their opening day starts, their season opener starts next Monday, or this coming Monday, excuse me, uh, at Chicago, and then they, the following Monday they play at home against Oakland. So, and the biggest thing. For the Twins this year is the All Star Game at Target Field. That's going to be Minneapolis is going to be electric. That atmosphere is going to be so much fun to watch. So that's the biggest aspect from the season. So yeah, that's going to be huge for the city. Yeah. Uh, I actually plan on going if I'm around. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll be here, but if I am here, I'm definitely going. Uh, I've never been to an All Star Game. That's, yeah. That should be really fun. Yeah, if they they have multiple events going on there. I know there's a 5K race going on there. Um, you have the Celebrity Softball Game. You have the Home Run Derby. I mean, there's so much going on in Minneapolis that weekend. That you know, if you have time, check it out because it will be a, pretty much a once in a lifetime experience. All right. So having the All Star Game in your city, do you think that motivates the team to try to do even better, or does that you know do something to the team to you know get them more more up for the season than it would if they didn't have the All Star Game in their, their town? Um, I think it can. I mean, it can be a good motivator, but also you play 162 62 games. All Star Game is just one game, um, and you know not you're. Every, at least one player from every team makes it. You're not guaranteed, you know, some teams have 10 players go. But um, it can be a good motivator. But when the twin situation is going to be tough, they need a lot more than just the All-Star game to motivate them. So. All right. And this year, Mauer, Joe Mauer, he's moving to uh, first base. Yep. Uh, how do you see that move working out for him? I think it's going to work fine. He's had issues behind the plate, I mean, with his knees. And, his. you know, he had a concussion last season, too. So that ended his season early. Um, I think it'll be a good move, you know. Just get him. He'll he'll still hit like he does. I mean, he's still a good hitter and everything. I just different positions not going to change how he plays. So, all right. So uh, taking a look at the rest of the MLB here, uh, what are your predictions for uh, who, do you, who do you think is going to go to playoffs this year? Right, what do you think? Playoffs. I think, like I said earlier, the World Series for sure. Dodgers and Tigers. I believe. Um, another sleeper team you could almost say would be Oakland. I mean, they made it the past couple seasons. But I think, you know, they lost in the first round. But I think they'll go farther than the first round this year. Um, for the NL side, I'd probably say the Cardinals again. You know, they're probably, I see them being in the NLCS. Um, they play the past couple of years. They've been good as well. You know, they're going to be they're going to be the one in that World Series. So I think they'll be another good team this season. All right, how do you think the Seattle Mariners are going to do this season? Mariners, Cano, the Cano signing is a big, big move. Um, I think they're getting better with pitching. You know, Felix Hernandez is still there. So he'll be doing okay I think um, they just they have a lot of young talent and they are getting better they're figuring out stuff and I think they'll I think they'll be better so all right uh, what are some other major major offseason moves that you 
things that have just changed the landscape of the MLB like significantly? Um, just pretty much the Yankees. They had a lot of big signs this year. They had that pitcher from Japan. He, you know, um, it's, that's, that was a big major signing. So they did a lot in the offseason, too. They've spent a lot of money. Um, that was, I think the Yankees are going to be good as well, too. But that's, yeah, I'd say the Yankees and... Speaking of the Yankees, you got the, uh, the A-Rod situation, and you got uh, Jeter's last season. Yep. Uh, so I guess the combination of that, I mean, you, you got the stain of A-Rod, but then you got, you got Jeter's last season, his last go-around. You think that's going to rally the team to, to do better than what they did last year, or maybe try to get this last hurrah for Jeter? I think so, too. Yeah, I think so, because Jeter is the captain of that team. He is, he's known as the captain everywhere. And I think, you know, with his last season, he's going to want to end on a bang. And I think it'll be, you know, the Yankees are going to make a run for the playoffs as well. So um, they have all the talent there. They, they have everything. So it'll be, it'll be fun to watch them. Now, if they somehow got to the World Series, would that shock you? No. Honestly, it wouldn't shock me. Um, winning the World Series, maybe it would shock me a little bit. But if they made it to the World Series, it would not shock me. It wouldn't be a big surprise. So. All right, well, make sure you uh, keep your eyes on that storyline there for the Yankees. But uh, thank you guys for joining us this week on Game Point. For everyone else involved, I want to thank you guys. And remember, it's a whole new ball game.